Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Good Food Institute's webinar on plant-based meat, seafood, eggs, and dairy. My name is Molly O'Donnell, and I'm the Corporate Engagement Project Manager here at the Good Food Institute. Today, my colleagues and I will cover the ever-evolving plant-based industry, including sales, the commercial landscape, investments, scientific progress, regulatory and public funding updates, and industry forecasts. We'll have time at the end for Q&A, and we'll also do our best to answer questions via text during the presentation. I'll ask that you all add any questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat, as this helps us better track and respond to questions. For those of you not yet familiar with the Good Food Institute, we are an international nonprofit, not an industry trade group. And we focus on advancing alternative protein science and research, mobilizing resources and talent, advocating for fair policy and public funding, and empowering partners across the food system to create a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We do this work through three key programmatic areas, corporate engagement, science and technology, and policy. And we're funded entirely by philanthropy. So if you find the insights and resources we provide useful, please consider making a donation. GFI's work focuses on feeding a growing population sustainably, efficiently, and safely. Industrial animal agriculture is responsible for almost 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions. It uses 75% of agricultural land, yet it only provides a third of the global protein supply. Rather than asking consumers to give up products they love, GFI focuses on making meat, eggs, and dairy in a way that doesn't contribute to environmental degradation or public health risk. Today's webinar is part of a series based on GFI's annual State of the Industry Reports released this month. I'd like to thank the many GFI team members who contributed to this project, as well as external partners who supported with data and fact-checking. GFI relies on our community to share the latest and greatest alternative protein related data with you. So if you'd like to help make our reports, webinars and other open access resources as accurate as possible, please tell us about your work by joining the company database and by responding to surveys when we send them out. Signing up for a monthly industry newsletter is the best way to stay updated on our research. Today's presentation will cover new developments in the plant-based industry. Plant-based meat, egg, and dairy products seek to replicate the sensory experiences of animal products while adding value propositions associated with plant-based foods. These products have lower environmental footprints and they're healthier on average than conventional animal products. They can be made with a wide array of ingredients, including mung beans, peas, soy, oats, and the list goes on. Those interested in popular plant-based ingredients can check out our plant protein primer for more information. And with that overview, I'd like to pass things off to my colleague, Emma, to share an overview of plant-based sales data from the past few years. Thanks, Molly, and hello, everyone. I'm Emma Ignashevsky, Associate Director of Industry Intelligence and Initiatives on GFI's Corporate Engagement Team. Next, we're going to dive into our perspective on the sales trends of plant-based products. And I do want to note that I expect many of you have seen headlines recently like, is plant-based meat dead? Was it a fad? Is it all hype? A lot of the media coverage would have you believe so. However, what we're going to do today is to look at the data a bit more closely, including sales from different channels and regions and some consumer insights. We'll both dive into the nuance and zoom out to the broader picture, and we'll unpack the challenges and opportunities in the industry. And I can tell you from the start that those headlines are misleading, and there's much more to this story. Also, performance varies across plant-based categories, across regions, and across channels, so there's also not just one single story. So what's really happening? This chart shows both dollar and unit sales for total plant-based foods in U.S. retail over the last four years. This is data that GFI and the Plant-Based Foods Association commissioned from SPINS, and you can dig in more to our full insights online. But you can see here that plant-based alternatives to animal products are an $8 billion market in U.S. retail. That's a far cry from a little fad, and also the trend line doesn't look anything like a fad, which would look like a steep up, then down. And actually, dollar sales grew 7% last year, 
as price increases drove most growth across the store. And while unit sales declined slightly, they did so right alongside total food and beverage, which was also down by 3%. Zooming out over the past three years, plant-based foods grew 44% in dollar sales and 23% in units. Here we look at the same data, but for plant-based meat. Plant-based meat dollar sales have remained almost flat, down 1% in dollars, though unit sales have declined the past two years. Both dollars and units, however, remain significantly above pre-COVID levels. And it's important to note that recent results are on top of high double-digit growth, driven in part by an overstimulated market and channel shifts due to COVID, as well as large distribution increases over that period. So it's almost like if you ran a buy one, get one promotion and you're trying to lap that. Growth on top of 2020 was always going to be a challenge given the dynamics at play. However, as we'll see, there is certainly reason to believe that current products are at large, not fully meeting consumer expectations. And there is of course opportunity to correct for that. And while it's true that plant-based meat sales declined after overstimulated growth, so did animal-based meat sales. As you can see here, both categories saw significant growth in 2020, not the type of growth that you can pull off every single year, even in an emerging category. In 2021, unit sales declines were about the same for both categories. And then in 2022, conventional meat prices increased much more than in plant-based meat, which drove a dollar sales increase, even though units were down 4%. Taking a longer view of plant-based meat sales, the picture becomes more clear. Plant-based meat dollar sales have absolutely taken off in the last decade in U.S. retail. Again, clearly not a fad, which tends to spike very quickly and then rapidly decline. Fads also tend to be limited to a region or two, but we've seen growth across the globe, as we'll dive into in a little bit. I will note that this chart is based on Euromonitor estimates. So the top, line the top line number is a bit different than what I just shared from SPINS, but it's generally in line with that data. Here's that same Euromonitor data just presented a little bit differently, which I think also helps to contextualize this moment that we're in. 40% of plant-based meat dollar sales over the last 15 years have been in just the last three years. And while Euromonitor estimates a $1.7 billion market today, 10 years ago, that was only $500 million. Additionally, retail is only one piece of the market. So here we add in estimates for food service and e-commerce sales. One great reason to look at it this way is that there's been huge volatility across retail, food service, and e-commerce in the last four years. In 2020, due to the pandemic, we know that a really large portion of the food service dollars in the US shifted to grocery stores. And across categories, this resulted in unprecedented retail growth and high bars for lapping this growth. 2021 and 2022 have seen the food service channel earn back much of its prior volume and retail has started to settle on units, although dollars of course are being further affected by inflation. Meanwhile, e-commerce sales have grown rapidly, although on a very small base, stimulated by the pandemic. And looking at dollar sales here, we can see that combined estimated sales for plant-based meat specifically grew slightly at 2% in the last year. And then let's look worldwide as well. Estimated plant-based meat global retail sales reached $6.1 billion in 2022, with dollar sales up 8%, and weight sales up 5% from prior year. Over the last five years, the category has roughly doubled in size. Looking at another region, Europe, this slide shows combined plant-based meat sales for 13 European countries. The market here has grown 19% in the last two years with 3% dollar growth last year. Units were also slightly up last year at 1%. While not shown here specifically, Germany is the largest market for plant-based meat in Europe and has in fact started to see conventional meat sales decline. Shifting towards some consumer insights, I'm gonna take a minute to talk a little bit more about the taste barrier that we are all familiar with. According to the latest Power of Plant-Based report from FMI, 
which aligns with many other consumer surveys, haste remains the number one reason why consumers have not tried plant-based meat. It's also the number one reason why consumers who have tried it once or twice did not come back. Thus, taste appears to be both a perception issue and also a real shortcoming. The good news is that this is something the industry can work with, and there is a lot of innovation happening on this front. Cost is the second reason, and as I'll show you, plant-based products, particularly plant-based meat, remain at a significant price premium to conventional options. I'll also note that although dwarfed by taste and cost concerns, processness and too many ingredients are showing up here as reasons why consumers say they haven't tried or didn't continue buying plant-based meat. We've also seen surveys that indicate that consumers' perception of them as healthy has really decreased. And even if these factors may be overblown in the media, maintaining or improving health perceptions will be important to plant-based meat capturing more and more market share. This is particularly true given that health is one of consumers' top stated reasons for switching in the first place. So this is a consumer education and marketing opportunity, and it's also a product development and renovation opportunity. Here, we can clearly see that the price premium for plant-based proteins remains significant, with plant-based meat overall costing 67% more per pound. That gap is smaller in beef, the most developed segment within plant-based meat, but it's still significant. For chicken, pork, and turkey, the price is on average more than double. So just to recap, we're hearing that products don't meet many consumers' taste expectations and they cost a lot more. That's a tricky proposition, right? That said, consumer survey data clearly shows that consumers are interested in the category if it can deliver. And we can see from panel data that retained consumers didn't decrease their spend in 2022, which is actually quite promising. It signals some loyalty, even amidst clear opportunity. Consumers indicate that they are open to switching if their key barriers to consumption are solved for. This slide is from a recent BCG and Blue Horizon report, and it speaks to alt proteins at large, not just plant-based. Again, we see taste and also health as key barriers. And according to this research, the share of committed consumers would double if these challenges were solved for. Looking more closely at the full span of plant-based categories in US retail, we see categories in various stages of development. Plant-based milk is an almost $3 billion category in US retail with 15% market share of all fluid milk and unit sales declined just slightly last year, a bit less than that of total foods and in line with conventional dairy milk. Areas of growth included plant protein powders and liquids, as well as plant-based baked goods and plant-based eggs. A few more categories to highlight include plant-based creamer. So since 2019, both dollar and unit sales of plant-based creamer have about doubled. This category's growth may have benefited from product and ingredient similarities to plant-based milk, which as we know is the most developed plant-based category and the one that most consumers have the greatest familiarity with. Plant-based ice cream sales declined a little in 2022, and ice cream is a unique category. It has the opportunity to really tap into consumer desire for indulgence, while also offering consumers a product with better for you associations as a plant-based product. Plant-based yogurt dollar sales increased in 2022, while unit sales declined in line with total food sales. Household penetration of plant-based yogurt is relatively small at 9%, indicating a large potential runway if products can meet consumer needs. Plant-based cheese saw modest declines in the last year. Only a small portion of consumers say that plant-based cheese tastes as good as conventional cheese, indicating further innovation and engagement opportunities. Meanwhile, plant-based eggs is a small but mighty category. It's growing rapidly on a small base, and price was a huge story in the egg category in 2022. So in 2021, we saw that plant-based eggs cost about $5 more per pound than animal-based eggs, but that gap shrank to about $3.50 in 2022, driven primarily by conventional egg price increases, but also by decreases in plant-based egg prices. This chart shows the dollar share that plant-based categories hold within their respective overall categories. The green is total marketplace, while yellow is for the natural channel. 
And most of these shares haven't changed meaningfully in the past year, but there are two key things to note here. One is just how much greater share most plant-based dairy products have of their respective categories compared to meat and eggs. And another is how high the plant-based share is in the natural channel where retail, retail food trends tend to start. Both of these points signal opportunity for plant-based meat to catch up to other plant-based category shares. We see that plant-based milk is a much more developed uh, category having started to really take off in the 2000s. And today, 42% of all fluid milk sold in the natural channel is plant-based. I'll also note here the incredible success of plant-based creamer in the natural channel with its 82% share of total creamer. So to sum it up, I'll underscore the need to continue investing in advances toward plant-based meat that reach taste and price parity with conventional ones. This will help attract new consumers, particularly meat eaters, to the plant-based meat category, a huge opportunity given that household penetration of plant-based meat is only 18% in U.S. retail today. These improvements will also likely drive increased purchase by existing, by existing consumers. And of course, alongside this work, there's an opportunity to refine and also more clearly communicate the value proposition of plant-based products. With that, I'll pass it back to Molly. Thanks, Emma. Um, and now that we've gone over plant-based sales, I'd like to note a few high-level trends we've seen in the commercial landscape. At retail, the plant-based category is still evolving and diversifying. As Emma mentioned, plant-based subcategories are in varying stages of development, and there are still a number of animal products that don't yet have a widely distributed plant-based counterpart. But retailers are continuing to close this gap. Our sales data shows that there were roughly 450 net new plant-based SKUs in U.S. retail last year. I'd like to note a few high-level trends from retail launches. First, we've seen an influx of plant-based versions of long-standing branded food products. In 2022, consumers got to try plant-based versions of well-known and nostalgic foods like Baby Bell wax-covered cheese, Philadelphia cream cheese, and Ego waffles. This is a signal that companies are betting on plant-based alternatives by lending valuable household brand names to plant-based products. And second, we've seen an expansion in plant-based private label products. Private label offers an opportunity to make plant-based products more accessible to consumers at lower price points. And 2022 saw a number of retailers launch new plant-based private label products. For example, Amazon Fresh and Asda both launched new plant-based lines, while Whole Foods and Trader Joe's added new plant-based products to their rosters. And on the food service side, we also saw expanding distribution. Notably, plant-based foods are joining menus in every segment of food service, from QSR chains like Starbucks and KFC, to specialty restaurants, to college campuses, airlines, and school cafeterias. And one case study I'd like to point out here is Burger King's progress in nudging diners to choose plant-based. GFI research indicates that the default menu option has a powerful influence on consumer choice. So making plant-based items the default choice, as Burger King has done in a trial in Austria, as well as an entirely plant-based location trials in five European countries, is a fantastic work way for food service operators to increase plant-based food consumption, thus lowering their greenhouse gas footprint. And we've also seen large food companies continue to increase their involvement in the plant-based industry. Nearly every one of the top global food companies is involved in the plant-based industry through either investment, acquisition, or partnerships, and most manufacture their own plant-based food products. And one emerging area of opportunity for the conventional meat industry to become involved in alternative proteins is by incorporating plant protein and vegetables into meat products. In the last few years, several meat companies have launched blended meat products, including Purdue, Hormel, and Tyson. Blended products may provide value to health-focused consumers looking to increase their consumption of vegetables and plant proteins, or to reduce their consumption of conventional meat, and they have a relatively lower environmental impact than conventional meat products, which could help manufacturers reach their sustainability goals. And one of the other ways large meat and food producers can increase involvement in the alternative protein industry is through strategic partnerships. 
GFI counted 25 new strategic partnerships in the plant-based industry in 2022, most focused on product development, scale up and distribution. And with that, I'll pass things off to my colleague, Daniel, to discuss investments. Thanks, Molly. My name is Daniel Gertner, and I'm the business analyst on the corporate engagement team here at GFI. In this section, we'll take a look at private investments in plant-based companies and how those investments fit into the larger economic landscape. First, looking at broader alternative protein funding. Alternative protein investments totaled $2.9 billion in 2022, down 42% versus 2021. That decline tracked with the broader private investment environment. The drop in alternative protein funding was only slightly larger than the 35% decrease in total global funding across all sectors in 2022. It was also smaller than the declines of some popular VC funded sectors like FinTech, which fell 46% year over year. So what trends are influencing these global investment declines? While 2022 was a challenging funding environment, environment for companies across industries, falling public equity markets, rising interest rates due to high inflation, ongoing impacts of the pandemic, and the invasion of Ukraine all contributed to reduced investment activity across sectors in 2022. And in a relatively young sector like alternative proteins, a handful of sizable raises can drive the top line investment numbers. In 2022, for example, 3% of deals accounted for half of total investment dollars in all proteins. So in a sector this size, one investment can have significant implications for year-to-year -year variations in investment totals. Taking a longer term view, over the past decade, cumulative investments in alternative proteins reached $14 billion. That means on average, all protein investments nearly doubled every year over that span. Investments in plant-based companies continue to lead the way for alternative protein funding. Plant-based investments totaled $1.2 billion last year, bringing all-time plant-based funding to $7.8 billion. That was a deceleration from the $2 billion raised in 2021, but it was well above the $703 million raised in 2019. That was the year of Beyond Meat's record-breaking IPO, and a general turning point for investor interest in alternative proteins. Of that almost $8 billion in cumulative investments, nearly 70% of the total dollar value occurred in the last three years. Companies in the space continue to innovate, and according to Euromonitor, global retail sales are increasing. Plus, plant-based meat remains an important sustainability opportunity for investors, also helping its long-term investment prospects. Plant-based investments in 2022 were led by regions outside the U.S. Funding in APAC and Europe both surpassed North American investments for the first time ever in 2022, and Middle East, primarily Israel, funding nearly matched North American totals. Investments in APAC grew by nearly $100 million in 2022 to $372 million while Europe investments increased 15% to $304 million. Middle East funding nearly quadrupled to $200 million in 2022. Even though North America and specifically the US has historically led the plant-based investment story, this global investor diversification we've seen in recent years should increase the industry's long-term resiliency. Another trend in the plant-based market in recent years has been the increasing frequency of liquidity events. Liquidity events represent the sale of owners' interests in a company through merger, acquisition, buyout, or IPO. As the industry continues to develop, we expect this trend to continue as firms evolve to secure technology, manufacturing processes, and talent. This may take the form of strategic mergers and acquisitions in the near term, as the market environment has discouraged IPOs. Investments in alternative proteins, including plant-based foods, will be an essential part of combating the climate crisis. Investments are crucial for the scale-up of these critical but underinvested climate mitigation solutions. Animal agriculture contributes 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, Yet alternative protein and plant-based investments comprise only a small fraction of total climate technology funding. 
At the same time, over 500 billion in total climate investments made each year have helped renewable energy now constitute more than a quarter of global power generation. Meanwhile, alt-protein meat sales make up less than 1% of the global meat market. Increased public and private investment in alternative proteins can help this sector achieve considerable global impact. An impact often begins with measurement. To help industry participants measure some of the climate and other non-financial characteristics of all proteins, GFI and FAIR developed a new set of environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, frameworks for the alternative protein industry. These frameworks can help investors better understand the impacts of their investments. So zooming out, we know the alt protein industry has a long path toward delivering on its potential. The investment gap between alt proteins and other climate tech indicates a huge potential for growth in alternative proteins if they are able to attract the capital that can help them scale. And now I'll pass it to Pre to cover updates in plant-based science and technology. Thank you for that update, Daniel. My name is Pri Pinescu, and I am the plant-based lead scientist on the SciTech team at GFI. I'm excited to provide some highlights of the 2022 innovations in plant-based science and technology. Many industry crop breeding programs currently focus on optimizing for high overall crop yield and resistance to environmental stresses. But directing attention toward enhancing protein content and functionality can further generate economic and nutritional value for crops. In 2022, companies that have traditionally focused on plant breeding efforts further their strategies by diversifying by beyond soy and, pro and pea, where Nusacer develops their non-GMO high-protein chickpea strains, and Equinom is increasing their R&D efforts for ultra-high-protein chickpeas, faba beans, mung beans, and cowpeas. Crop companies are also focused on accelerating commercialization efforts for high-quality protein ingredients. Benson Hill focused on downstream partnerships with large-scale ingredient manufacturer ADM and Kellogg's plant-based product producer Morningstar Farms. And Equinom similarly partnered with a large-scale ingredient manufacturer, AGT Food and Ingredients, in enhancing production scale through collaborations across the supply chain is a strategy that will appreciably lower plant-based food costs. Ingredients other than proteins have also been optimized to bolster the taste, texture, and nutrition of end products. In particular, 2022 was a banner year for alternative fat research and product development. Just a few of the examples are in, um, of this development include Jibidon's launch of Prime Lock Plus, which is a plant-based replacement for beef and pork fats made from encapsulating coconut oil and flavors. Paragon Pure's debut of their plant-based fat Oleo PBM, an Oleo gel made from upcycled rice bran oil and rice bran wax. And additionally, Cargill committed to bringing Cubic's alternative fats to market in 2023, where Cubic creates vegetable oil emulsions and, encapsulation, and encapsulates omega-3 fatty acids. Encapsulation, emulsion, oleo gel technologies all reduce the separation of plant oils from the product by protecting them so that they gradually release during cooking and consumption. And this controlled release creates flavorful, juicy, textured mouthfeel for the end products. Additionally, 2022 saw a number of companies innovate clean label binders to replace methyl cellulose. So for example, Fiberstar is planning to commercialize their citrus fiber ingredient, Citrify, with the help of Jibidon. And Citrify, in combination with agar, native starch, and psyllium, can potentially be used as a binder that can replace methyl cellulose. Additionally, Mila created a protein-based hydrogel that functions as a binding and gelling agent that, again, can replace methyl cellulose and other gums. Extrusion technologies that expand beyond the traditional low and high moisture extrusion processes have the potential to drive texture parity to conventional hole cuts. Scientists from ETH Zurich are revamping extrusion to include two separate extrusion attachments for P proteins as well as emulsified fats, and then combine them to create 3D marbled plant-based meats. And technologies beyond extrusion, such as 3D printing, fiber spinning, are increasingly being applied to create plant-based protein products to enhance the texture and overall structure. 
demonstrating its increased popularity, several companies that focus on 3D printing plant protein products secured funding this year, including Redefine Meat, Nova Meat, Moji Meats, and Revo Foods. And while fiber spinning hasn't made waves in recent years, in 2022, the company Tender did announce that they plan to spin plant fibers to create realistic plant-based meat products. This technology was initially designed to create scaffolding for cultivated meat, but the pivot will provide novel insight into applying spinning technology to texturize plant-based meats. The efficiencies in plant-based food production provide environmental benefits even without optimized raw materials, ingredient processing, and manufacturing technologies. However, as research across the technology stack optimizes for taste, texture, price, and scale of plant-based foods, ongoing environmental assessments can help companies understand how the adoption of specific innovations can help further improve their environmental footprint. One environmentally sustainable strategy to improve food losses across the value chain during plant-based food manufacturing is valorizing whole crops and processes for human consumption. Upcycling side streams for alternative proteins continued to gain momentum in 2022, including the following key highlights. DSM launched their upcycled canola protein isolate, Canola Pro, which boasts excellent functionality and digestibility. Evergrain, backed by Anheuser-Busch InBev, opened their barley pr protein production facility, which is capable of producing 7,000 tons of protein isolate per year from brewers bent grain that AB InBev produces. Additionally, New, New Zealand's Off-Piss Provisions partnered with Singapore-based food experts to produce plant-based protein from fermented agricultural byproducts, including soybean skin, wheat stock, brewers bent grain, and leftover fruit. In addition to providing more sustainable routes towards plant-based food production, valorizing side streams also has the potential to improve production revenue. And while taste, cost, and convenience remain primary drivers for plant-based food con consumer demand, health and nutrition are also on consumers' minds. Sharing clear, understandable nutrition data about plant-based meat is just as critical as, production, as product reformulation efforts that improve the nutrition and research efforts that enable plant-based meat producers to even use more nutritious crops, ingredients, and processes. Overall, plant-based meats can be healthier than their animal source counterparts. Plant-based meat products on the market today generally have fewer calories, less saturated fat per pound compared to animal meat products. Plant-based meat products also have zero uh, cholesterol and always contain, almost always contain fiber. In 2022, a literature review of 40 plus studies on the healthiness and environmental sustainability of plant-based meat alternatives compared to animal products concluded that plant-based alternatives impart a wide range of health benefits, including lower cholesterol, improved gut health, and lower risks of cardiovascular disease than their, counter, uh, their animal counterparts. Collaborations across the plant-based uh, scientific ecosystem can accelerate innovation and progress. They can also shorten product supply chains, provide opportunities for early in innovators to enter the industry, and reduce duplicative efforts across the industry, spurring joint um, research and development. In 2022, there was a surge of promising collaborations across governments, academia, and industry, and I'll briefly highlight just one of these efforts. Denmark's Nova Nordisk Foundation launched Plant to Food in 2022, where the five-year uh, project is focused on funding pre-competitive open research collaborations between the food industry and academia, where all um, knowledge and results are shared openly for everyone to use and reuse. It was funded by, um, by Nova Nordisk Foundation for about 27 million euros. And the vision is really to have a more sustainable plant-based system where health, that's healthy for the planet and the population. Plant to Foods University partners include Our House University, the University of Copenhagen, the Technical University of Denmark, and Wageningen University in the Netherlands, as well as a fifth profit, uh, partner, the nonprofit Food and Bio Cluster Denmark. More public private collaborations like these are necessary to accelerate plant based meat, seafood, eggs, and dairy innovation in production in, in coming years. While significant bottlenecks still exist for the plant based industry, strategic collaborations and open access research can really help address those bottlenecks, drive innovation, and elevate the industry as a whole. 
And now I'll pass it to Maddie, who will provide updates on plant-based regulations and public funding. Thanks, Sabrina. My name is Maddie Cohen. I'm the senior regulatory attorney on the policy team at GFI, and I'll provide a brief overview of regulatory updates in a few key jurisdictions. Starting with the U.S., um, in February, FDA published draft guidance on the labeling of plant-based milk products. Uh, the draft guidance does permit the use of the term milk on plant-based products, along with terms like drink and beverage, but it also includes a new front-of-pack labeling scheme that would have products that do choose to use the term milk on the label also include a comparative nutrient statement um, next to the product's name that lists nutritional differences between the product and cow's milk. And FDA is currently taking public comments on the guidance and will likely release a final version of the guidance at some point in the future. FDA has also stated that it's going to draft guidance on plant-based milk alternatives to other animal-derived foods, um, but we don't know yet when that guidance will be published. There were also a few label censorship bills introduced in individual states recently. Uh, Kansas passed a bill limiting the use of meat terms on non-animal products, uh, but the bill did contain a safe harbor provision that will allow plant-based products to continue to use meat terms as long as they include a modifier like plant-based. Texas is also considering a bill that would impact plant-based meat labeling. Um, that also in its current form uh, does contain a safe harbor provision, although also contains some other specific provisions on labeling like the size of that um, modifying phrase. And that bill is expected to be passed soon, um, but won't go into effect until September. And uh, Missouri passed a similar law a few years ago and GFI is working with the ACLU and ALDF to challenge that law in court um, and that proceeding is ongoing. So we don't know the fate of Missouri's law yet. In India, um, the Food Safety and Standards Authority finalized a regulation on vegan foods that sets standard for all foods that are considered vegan and requires the use of a specific government designated vegan logo on these foods. The agency also amended its food safety and standards regulation for the approval of non-specified foods, um, which generally apply to any novel foods that don't have their own specific regulations. And those amendments um, modify the process for obtaining pre-market approval in India and also implement a post-market monitoring program for novel foods. Next slide. Uh, in Switzerland, the plant-based meat company Planted won a lawsuit against uh, a local regulator in Zurich that had instructed the company to stop using meat terms on its plant-based meat products. Um, the court held that using species names like chicken and pork on plant-based labels wasn't confusing or misleading, um, and it would actually help consumers understand the nature of these products. But the regulator in Zurich has appealed the decision to the nation's highest court, and that appeal is pending. So we'll likely see by the end of the year whether that decision stands. Um, Canada saw a similar lawsuit in 2022. A plant-based company called Rossum Raw Vegan won a legal challenge against the city of Montreal after the city sued the company for using the word cheese on its vegan cream cheese labels. Um, claiming that the product didn't meet either the local or national definition for the term cream cheese. Uh, the lower court initially agreed with the city, but was overturned on appeal. Um, and the appellate court held that the definition of cream cheese only applies to animal dairy products and therefore doesn't restrict the labeling of plant-based products. Finally, looking at the EU and UK, there weren't any major updates in 2022 um, in the EU, the novel food regulation and GM food regulations continue to apply to all novel plant-based products and pre-market authorization is required from EFSA. Uh, unfortunately, the EU continues to ban dairy terms like yogurt and butter on plant-based products. And we also saw some individual countries like France and Belgium try to ban meat terms on plant-based products, although um, the French decree is still suspended. 
Um, and the UK has retained um, EU's novel food and GM food regulations for now. But in late 2022, the UK launched a review of these regulations and plans to evaluate other potential regulatory models for novel foods. So we may see a different regulatory system in the UK in the coming years. And with that, I will pass it to Michael to discuss public funding. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, so I'm Michael Carter. I'm a policy associate here at GFI. Uh, 2022 saw some of the largest and most impactful public investments in plant-based proteins, with more governments around the world allocating more funding to more projects for more reasons. Late in 2021, Denmark pursued its greenhouse gas reduction goals by announcing a wide-ranging plan to build out its plant-based protein industry, including incentivizing farmers to grow protein-rich crops and developing a market for plant-based products. In 2022, the country began to deliver on that pledge by investing nearly $100 million in a plant fund to support research and market development. Canada, likewise, continued to invest in plant-based proteins through Protein Industries Canada, claiming to have invested over $127 million in 55 projects through the end of 2022. As a significant producer of protein-rich crops like yellow peas and canola, Canada is financing infrastructure for plant protein processing and supporting the development of new products to stimulate its domestic economy and value add its agricultural products. Similar strategies were employed by the European Union, which funded a $12 million project to develop plant-based products from domestic crops, and Sweden, which financed a, a farmer-owned plant protein processing facility. In the United States, research on plant-based product optimization continued through the Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. In Asia and the Pacific, uh, governments rounded out the surge in global investment for plant-based products with projects that supported both domestic food security and international economic strength. Australia's national government invested $75 million in three new plant, pro plant protein processing facilities in addition to $43 million provided by the state of South Australia, bringing total government funding to over $117 million. The government expects these facilities to create 8,500 jobs, allow farmers to value add their crops eight times over, and bolster Australia's export market to the rest of Asia. Singapore, meanwhile, responded to 2022's food supply chain disruptions by supporting the development of a high moisture extrusion contract manufacturing facility that can produce as much plant-based protein as 4.3 million chicken breasts. Earlier this year, Singapore was hit by an export ban on chickens from neighboring Malaysia, which was trying to control high prices in the wake of food supply volatility, reducing Singapore's supply of chicken by one third. The new facility will support more domestic food production as the country strives to produce 30% of its own food by 2030. Finally, President Xi Jinping of China called for protein diversification, including from plants, at China's most important political conference, saying, widening China's range of protein sources to include those harnessed from plants, microbes, and animal cells allows the nation to further bolster food security and nutrition. In September 2022, President Joe Biden released an executive order calling on federal agencies to produce a report on biotechnology and biomanufacturing, including on, quote, cultivating new food sources. That report was released just last month. This bold goals report includes recommendations from five federal departments, and alternative proteins feature prominently in the bold goals of both the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy. The U.S. Department of Agriculture highlights the role of alternative proteins to provide more consumer choices, improved sustainability, and equitable access to nutritious foods, while the Department of Energy highlights the potential of fermentation-derived proteins to increase food production while reducing global agricultural land use. You can see two of the specific goals from the report listed here, including the USDA's goal of developing new food and feed sources, including production of novel or enhanced protein and fat sources at scale. Both agencies include specific goals and recommendations for alternative proteins R&D, commercialization scale-up, and public-private partnerships. The White House Office of Science and Technology, Technology Policy will lead the development of a strategy and implementation plan to execute on R&D priorities and other actions identified in this report. Now I'll pass it on to Daniel for the forecast. 
Thank you, Michael. Now we'll look at the alternative protein and plant-based forecasting landscape. Forecasts can help us visualize where a market might be headed, and they can also help identify key accelerants and roadblocks on the way to those potential outcomes. But to achieve or exceed projections, industry participants need to continuously work to make products tasty, affordable, and accessible. Plant-based meat forecasts predict continued growth for the plant-based meat market. In general, forecasts published more recently contained lower growth expectations than those published earlier. But even the most conservative projections expect growth. The lowest estimate of these forecasts, UBS's projection for a 2030 market size of $14 billion, is more than double today's market size. It's also clear that plant-based meat is an important factor for overall alternative protein industry growth. Plant-based meat is currently more established than cultivated or fermentation-enabled proteins in the marketplace. So fairly or unfairly, that often means it's used as a barometer for the health of the entire alternative protein industry. Despite a more challenging environment in recent years, the long-term prospects for the sector remain strong. Multiple studies show consumers expect to eat more plant-based foods in the future than they do now. As products improve and prices fall, this increased consumption is more likely to materialize. Plus, plant-based sales and investment growth in several global regions are building momentum in the global market. Finally, plant-based meat's environmental benefits mean it'll remain an important ESG consideration even in difficult market conditions. But challenges remain for plant-based meat. Consumers, consumer surveys show that the average plant-based meat product doesn't yet match conventional meat's sensory experience. The still significant price premium of plant-based meat compared to conventional meat also poses a threat to the industry's ability to capture significant market share. Other factors that can help encourage plant-based meat purchases like novelty and positive health perceptions have also faced tests recently. While those challenges are significant, the fact remains that conventional meat consumption continues to grow. The FAO projects the global meat market will increase from 360 million metric tons in 2022 to 455 million metric tons by 2050. Global climate, biodiversity, food security, and public health goals hang in the balance. These will be impossible to achieve by doubling down on today's methods of producing meat. Plant-based meat can play an important role in transforming the global protein supply. So where is the plant-based market headed? We expect 2023 to be a year of moderate global growth for the industry. Consumers will continue to shake the lingering effects of inflation, and global interest in the space is likely to support overall performance. Investments in plant-based companies are likely to follow global funding trends with ESG considerations remaining top of mind for category participants. Meanwhile, large plant-based companies will further implement their asset light and strategic growth strategies set into motion in 2022. On the product side, improvements will be supported by technological advancements and an increased willingness to create hybrid products. All of these things will play important roles in supporting the growth of the plant-based meat, egg, and dairy industries, and the larger alternative protein market. And with that, I'll pass it back to Molly. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you all for tuning in to our presentation on plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy. We're excited about the progress and potential of the plant-based industry, and we hope you are too. But we know there's still a ton of work to be done to reach a world in which alternative proteins are no longer alternative. So if you're involved in the plant-based industry, we want to stay in touch. Please sign up for our newsletter to stay looped into GFI resources and events. And with that, let's begin the Q&A. As a reminder, please add your questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So first question is for Emma. How do plant-based market trends, for example, growth in the last few years, compare to the food and beverage industry overall, as well as conventional meat? Yeah, thank you, Molly. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've seen in this past year is that the overall trends are, are relatively consistent across, um, across these three sort of comparables, right? In the long term, 
plant-based foods have represented a key growth driver for U.S. retail food. So from 2019 to 2022, benchmarking before COVID, plant-based food unit sales growth outpaced that of both animal-based food and also total food. But in this last year, plant-based food dollar sales grew 7%, while unit sales declined 3%. This is comparable to total food and beverage sales, dollar sales up 11%, units down 3%. And then we also saw something similar with conventional meat, dollar sales up 8%, units down 4%. Um, in addition to price increases for a given category, one thing that we're also seeing in the last year is that inflation can cut into consumer budgets. It tends to influence consumers to trade down from existing premium categories. Almost all plant-based categories continue to sell at a price premium compared to their conventional counterparts. So I think one thing that this underscores is the need for the plant-based industry to continue working towards innovations and scale up that can allow for products to really compete on price with conventional animal products. Thanks, Emma. Um, next question is what impact does sustainability have on plant-based purchase? Sure, so first to step back, we know that pound for pound compared to conventional meat, producing plant-based meat uses, in even the most conservative of cases, 96% less land, 95% less water. It emits 93% less air pollution and 83% less toxic chemicals. Um, and finally, a big issue on everybody's minds recently is, is, is climate change and plant-based meat tends to emit 86% less greenhouse gas emissions in the most conservative case. So in some, we know that plant-based meat is an incredible tool for mitigating climate change and biodiversity loss, as well as providing the protein people need and want with a fraction of the natural resources. But this question is also getting into how does, how does the consumer act upon that? And we know from surveys from Mintel that 21% of consumers identify environmental benefits as a reason why they purchase plant-based proteins. But that's actually a little bit dwarfed by twice as many who point to plant-based proteins being a good source of protein as one of their main motivators, 36% who point to health reasons, a few less pointing to variety, uh, some consumers point to taste. All of those tend to show up as higher on consumers' list than the sustainability reasons. And so what that really emphasizes is that while sustainability is a clear benefit of plant-based products, consumers are first and foremost driven by other attributes like taste and variety and nutritional benefits. Awesome, thank you, Emma. Um, so next question here is, why is the cost so high to make plant-based foods? Um, Pri, I'd love for you to share a bit of an overview of some of the main cost drivers for plant-based foods. Yeah, absolutely. So there are definitely opportunities across the value chain to reduce the prices of plant-based meats, but the long story short is that it's it's not scaled up yet. We're not producing at an economies of scale that allows us to bring those prices down, even though plants are uh, very affordable um, uh, it's, it's systems to be eating. Um, so the opportunities include improving crops so that they're even more suitable for plant-based foods. And that can end up improving crop uh, costs in downstream processing if the crops are tailor-made for these plant-based foods. Um, as I mentioned, scaling. So scaling ingredient production and texturization, building shared localized supply chains and applying process automation will also be able to alleviate some of these costs. And as mentioned in the uh, presentation, byproduct valorization of crops is another strategy that could eventually lower costs. Um, but the resulting side streams definitely have to be optimized in order to reap the financial benefits since we're not quite there on that utilization. But once we do optimize, um, that'll offer, under, offer another revenue stream for growers, ingredient processors, and manufacturers. Um, I highly recommend taking a look at this report, um, reducing prices of alternative proteins. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and I think you can dive a little bit deeper on those points there. Thank you, Pri. Yeah, we'll definitely make sure that's uh, sent out after uh, the webinar as well. 
Um, so next question here, uh, Kathleen's asking with respect to blended meat products, um, how do companies typically label these products and what are the labeling considerations? Um, so this category is still really early. And so it's definitely possible that labeling will continue to evolve as the category does, you know, they're seriously just a handful of products on the market. Um, and communicating the benefits of these products might require some nuanced product positioning. Um, again, new, pretty subtle category that requires a pretty clear value proposition. Um, so we've seen many of the early blended products being targeted towards kids and parents. Some examples include Purdue's Chicken Plus line with nuggets, tenders, and patties, and Hormel's Applegate's Well Carbs line. Um, so it seems brands are leaning into the added value proposition of blends, example, like chicken plus language. Um, but again, I think it's just too soon to identify category level trends in labeling or marketing. Um, but it's a great question. And yeah, brands do also use pretty clear labeling on the pack. So it might say, you know, chicken breast and vegetables or mushrooms and beef blends. So it's pretty um, sort of clearly labeled in that sense, but uh, definitely an emerging and evolving subcategory. Um, so next question here, um, I'll direct this one to Pri. Someone's asking about uh, where soy stands in the plant-based category. And I think another related question here is, um, you know, just wondering about maybe a more emerging plant protein sources. Yeah, great question. So unfortunately, um, yes, there's maybe some allergenicity issue, but I do think that a big uh, reason for the pivot away from soy, um, or not away, we're definitely still using soy in many of our products, but, um, it's a little bit of consumer perception. It's somewhat negative because of the monocultured production and contribute contribution to deforestation. Um, but it's really important to know that at least in the U S 97% of soybean meal is going for animal consumption. Um, and about two, 3% of that is going for human consumption. Um, so it's, it's important to note that those, that monoculture and deforestation contribute contributions, um, really aren't from the plant-based market, but consumers are having a hard time dealing with that nuance. Um, so we're definitely looking at other suitable, um, uh, plant protein sources and, this is also wonderful because crop diversification on farms has shown to improve biodiversification in general. Um, so definitely there's there's that uh, environmental reason to, to just diversify our plant sources. Um, some really exciting emerging ones. So, I mean, we've seen pea, it's, it's pretty well established, but it is a, a good alternative to soy. It has similar um, properties as soy, it has similar protein content, um, amino acid content a little bit less digestibility, but also less allergenicity to your point. Um, as of right now, it's it's deemed less allergenetic. Um, but there's also some really great things. I would, again, point to the pro plant protein primer, um, but we're seeing a lot of pulse production in Canada. So we're seeing, and in Europe, fava beans, lentils are becoming a lot more popular in some of these products. Um, in the egg category, people are really going... Um, uh, with some really unique uh, protein sources that have really good emulsification properties, again, focus on pulses. Um, then there's some really great aquatic sources that we could be looking towards like seaweed and duckweed, and those could provide really, really good economies of scale for production of these proteins once they're optimized. Um, so yeah, take a look at that plant protein primer because there's uh, more than 20 plant protein sources and we dive into a lot of their nutrition, allergenicity, cost, um, scalability, and it's a wonderful resource. Awesome. Thanks, Pri. Yeah, definitely noticing the, the ever-widening toolkit, I really think of um, alternative proteins. But to some of your earlier points, um, definitely still a lot of work to be done on the optimization front. Um, so we're running close to time here. Maybe just um, one more question for Maddie. So someone's asking if front of pack labeling requirements, um, how those might end up influencing plant-based milks and maybe other plant-based products. Sure. Yeah. So FDA um, is considering kind of a general front of pack nutrition labeling scheme, um, which could potentially be similar to ones that we've seen elsewhere that sort of have a stoplight system based on kind of nutrition and health um, but it's really early in that process, so it's hard to say exactly whether those would be a benefit for plant-based milks or not. 
Um, but specifically the guidance that FDA just put out in February would have um, a front of pack nutrition comparison to cow's milk on plant-based products that use the term milk. Um, and the nutrients that would be called out on the front of pack are actually slightly different from those that are already required to be um, included in the nutrition facts panel. So that could cause some consumer confusion. They also include nutrients like protein and magnesium that aren't under consumed by Americans. So that could also cause some confusion, perhaps um, persuading consumers to think that they should be like seeking out protein and beverages when that's really not necessary based on where they're already getting it in their diets. And it also just calls out plant-based milk products. So for example, cow's milk doesn't need to state that it contains you know, more saturated fat or more cholesterol or less fiber than plant-based milks. So that plant-based um, milk labeling scheme specifically, I think would um, you know, cause more confusion and more harm than good, um, but it's kind of too early to tell on the kind of greater front of pack labeling rules. Great. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and we are at time. Those are all the questions we'll have time for. So again, thank you so much to everyone for joining. Um, we'll email the recording and the slides to you as soon as we can. Um, and just a final reminder, our final event in the State of the Industry event series is going to be on Tuesday at um, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, we're going to have a virtual networking session using the MeetAway platform. Um, so you can sign up for that at GFI dot org slash events. We hope to see you there. And again, thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, we'll see you all soon. Bye.